Welcome back to the summer edition of the Shetland Astronomical Society's online radio. The Shetland Astronomical Society is based in the Shetland Islands to the northeast of Scotland and is the most northerly astronomical society in the UK. Shetland is located about 400 miles away from the Arctic Circle and the 60 degree north line of latitude passes through the southern part of the Shetland mainland. The southern tip of our mainland is about 100 miles from the nearest point on mainland Scotland. For this edition, we interviewed Brian Sheen of the Roseland Observatory in Cornwall on a return visit to Shetland. We also spoke to Dr Ken Rice from Edinburgh University who visited the islands as part of Science Week and gave talks at Shetland schools and gave a public lecture organised by the Shetland Astronomical Society. In our first interview, our roving reporter Paul Bendix asked Dr Rice further questions on the search for exoplanets, planetary formation, observing in Antarctica and why some professional astronomers need eBay accounts. Over to you, Paul. The SAS interview. Welcome to this broadcast by the Shetland Astronomical Society. We have today Dr. Ken Rice from the University of Edinburgh, who will be answering our various questions. Let's kick off with the first question, which is, Ken, the first exoplanets discovered were huge gas giants orbiting close to their parent star. Doesn't planet formation theory suggest that such gas giants should have been boiled away by their star? And yet they exist. Mm, how does theory reconcile with observation? So, so in fact the theory probably says that they'll be hot and, and the outer layers will maybe be evaporating, but very slowly. You have a lot of mass on these planets. And so, in fact, even if they are losing some mass, they can still live for billions and billions of years. They're not so hot that you will lose all the mass in a short time. So, in fact, the theory is entirely consistent with the observations. If they got too close, so there is an inner limit. We don't find them very, very, very close to stars because they would actually probably be ripped apart by the star's gravity before they boiled away. But we can still find them... Uh, a twentieth closer to, this, to their star than the Earth is to the Sun, and they're still perfectly happy to survive there for a very long time. Consistently with, yes, with current absolutely. Yeah, planet. absolutely, yeah, that's right. Yeah. Okay, so it's my problem with um, So trying to boil away theory. the okay. gas from a very massive planet is very difficult. Ah, okay, yeah. okay. Um, a, a curious thing. Um, brown dwarf stars, mm. uh, I believe these are stars which have not quite made the transition to sort of fully formed. Mm. Uh, some of these stars are thought to have planets around them. Yep. Um, how does that work? Um, possibly in exactly the same way. They may form in the same way as a normal star. They just happen to form at a lower mass and they might have a disk around them and that disk could then form another object in it which would be a planet around the brown dwarf. The other possibility is that actually brown dwarfs form in disks around more massive stars and if there are other planets in that disk, the brown dwarf could be thrown out of the system. But if it happens to have another planet thrown out with it, you could have two of them orbiting each other. So there are a couple of different models for how you might form brown dwarfs. But okay. uh, it's yeah. fairly reasonable to expect that some of them will have planets orbiting them as well. And it's possible that was exactly the same process that formed planets around normal stars. Okay, I think I'm going to have to go away and have a think about that answer because um, my head hurts. <laughs> okay, um, now, recent press article um, in Astrobiology magazine on the net um, talked about nomad planets. These are planets which are outside normal, don't have parent stars, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, if I understand the yeah, concept, yeah. they're sort of wandering about. Free floating, what we often call them, yes. Okay, talk to me about nomad planets. So I'm not sure whether we've, we've seen things that could be these planets. And there are certainly people who publish papers claiming to find them. I'm not 100% sure that it's completely accepted that what they've found are nomad planets. But if you run models of planet formation, it is extremely likely that some planets will be thrown out of a system. If you have multiple planets in a system, 
it's very likely that that system could become very unstable and extremely likely that some of those planets will be ejected to float freely through through the galaxy. So, so the existence of them is entirely expected. The problem is whether we have instruments sensitive enough to actually find these very faint, relatively cool objects in our galaxy. So, so I think they're almost certainly out there. It's a question of whether what we've found are actually these or something else. Okay, um, move on. Uh, you wrote a paper some time ago. Um, do all sun-like stars have planets? Isn't the answer, well, maybe they do and maybe they don't? Oh, certainly the answer is that. Uh, the, the argument there was simply that if you look at the amount of material around very young stars available for planet formation, there's a lot. So it doesn't have to be very efficient in order to produce a planet like the Earth. Ah. Only a small fraction of that material would need to be turned into an Earth-like planet in order for, the, for it to be there. So there's plenty of material around most very, very young stars. So therefore, given that we find big planets very commonly around stars like the Sun, we would, might expect to find smaller planets like the Earth even more often. And you know, at the moment, 10% of stars like the Sun have planets like Jupiter. So if it's easier to make smaller planets, then it could be close to all of the stars like the Sun have planets at least similar in mass and size to the Earth. Maybe not at the same distance, but All the right. same in size and mass. So it's just an argument that it's, the process doesn't have to be efficient in order to create Earth-like planets, at least in terms of mass and size. And because it doesn't have to be efficient, it can be common. Yes. Yeah. So We know that big gas giants are relatively common, and they're much bigger than the Earth. So, okay. you know, so if, if, if it's easier to make smaller planets and bigger planets. Earth, Earth size planets and Earth mass planets should be even more common. Okay, um, th this is a sort of perhaps a slightly dumber question. Um, stars powered by fusion reactions. People trying to produce power yeah. by fusion. If if I understand the the Brian Cox program that I saw recently, I can't remember what it's called. Um, we can make fusion for a very, very, very short time, but we need much higher temperatures yeah, that's right, yeah. than, than you find in the sun. Yeah. Why is that? Oh, that's a good question. I, oh, is it? No. I, I'm not sure I completely understand it. Probably because you have a temperature pressure relationship. So if you can produce the high pressure, you could probably have a lower temperature, but if you can't produce the high pressure, you'll need to have a much higher temperature for it to work. So. It's not a single thing that you need. You need, a, you need a pressure and a temperature in order for it to happen. And the sun has a high pressure and a high temperature, which both of which help, I suspect. I, okay. I may be wrong about this because this isn't my field, but I suspect that's the answer, that, that in fact it's because we probably can't... Pr it's easier to try and produce a much higher temperature than to try and produce that kind of pressure. Okay. Um, now, are you actually engaged in research at the moment? And if so, what? At the moment, I'm doing. I'm actually looking at some uh, signatures in the exoplanet data to try and understand, in fact, how they are influenced by the disk from which they form. So, but I'm also looking at some simulations of very early stages of star formation to try and see how the disks that form around young stars evolve, and how that influences star formation and planet formation. Okay. Um. I was thinking, well, is there anything you can do? To which the correct answer is, I don't know, Paul. Is there anything you can do? Um, we'll park that one. Uh, so, just as a sort of um, aside, you you spent some time in Antarctica. Uh, is there anything sort of particular that you can do in? Antarctica that you can't do anything else with regard to astronomy? Well, when I was doing that, I was probably working more in what we'd call space physics, so not quite what you'd think of as classical astronomy, sort of ah, the sun, the okay. influence of the sun on the Earth, so space weather type of stuff. And okay. the poles are interesting because the Earth has a magnetic field a bit like a bar magnet, Sure. and so the magnetic field lines tend to come down at the North Pole and the South Pole, and so the, the, the sort of solar eruptions that cause aurorae and, and space weather and things like that tend to be more evident at the poles and you can make measurements of radio waves and various other measurements that allow you to probe how the sun influences the earth. But there are some interesting things about the Antarctic for, the, for, for astronomy because um, it's quite dry right. and some of it's quite high. 
And so there are certain people who think that rather than sending big sort of telescopes up into space, build something very big in what's called Dome C in the Antarctic, because it's a very dry, very high site, and you'd actually get very good observations from that site, but a very difficult place to work. So there has been some astronomy done there, but, but they haven't actually gone ahead and built a big optical or, or, or optical-like telescope there because of the, the complexities of doing that. <coughs> And presumably these sorts of environmental challenges also apply to places like the top of Hawaii and the Atacama Desert. Yeah, but, I th I th but probably not to the same extent. extent you know, yes, there you're talking yes. about high altitudes, so less air, you know, vehicles yeah, sure. need to be modified to cope with that. And, but, but I don't think you get the same kind of storms. No. You're not nearly <laughs> as remote. Um, you can probably fly in fairly close to those places, whereas in the Antarctic in winter, you really can't get any close, very close to these places. Uh, you know, you really are cut off for six months or so, probably, um, unless you really desperately had to try and do something. Whereas I think in Hawaii, it's year round, you can access it. I think Chile's <laughs> year round. So, so I think that, although difficult, not nearly as difficult as trying to work in the Antarctic. Yes, and, and, and this is from someone who has actually done it. So, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll accept that with a, with a vengeance. Um, okay, um, turning to, to planets outside the solar system, uh, exoplanets, how, how do you find new exoplanets? So what <coughs> methods do you use, and, and is there any way that the amateur astronomer can assist? Um, so, so the most successful methods to date have been a method called radial velocity, where you measure the spectrum of the star and you use the Doppler effect, which means that as the star moves towards or away from us, the, the, the wavelength of the star's spectrum will shift very slightly, and you can use that to measure the velocity of the star. And if the star appears to be moving away from and then towards us, that tells us something must be going around that star. You can use that information to determine the mass of that object, how far it is from the star how circular or not its orbit is. There's various things we can determine. And in some cases, that might not be a planet. It might be another star or a brown dwarf. But in many cases, it has been a planet. Right? Um, but the other method is the transit method, where you just look at a star and measure its brightness. And then you wait for something to move between us and that star. And that will dim some of the light. And if it's something like 1%, that might be a Jupiter-like planet. If it's something smaller, it could be um, you know, something like an Earth-like planet. And there's no t reason why amateur astronomers couldn't do that. But one of the problems is there are many things that can give signatures like that. And from the ground, typically the noise in the, in the data means it's quite hard to distinguish between a planet moving in front of a star or another star potentially grazing across the bottom of that star that makes a dip similar. Um, so, so although it's, it's certainly possible, and, and the, in fact, some of the, the most successful teams use professional camera lenses to do this. They're not even using traditional telescopes. Oh. Um, in fact, the, the original, uh, project that was based in, in the UK actually had to buy these off eBay <laughs> because they couldn't find them anywhere else. So, 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 and, and of course they, they they weren't funded because the funding council didn't believe it would work. So they had to get their own money from their own universities and buy these these professional Canon lenses from from eBay to build their own little little wide angle. And the reason you want to use camera lenses, I believe, is because you want a nice wide angle to look as many stars as possible. Um, whereas if you used a, a, a sort of a ten inch amateur telescope, the wide, the, the field of view would be small. And so you'd have to keep moving it to look at lots of stars. And so, so this is why you'd want to have a nice wide angle to look at as many stars as possible at the same time. Okay, interesting. Okay, okay, let me think about that one. Um, now, can, are we able to detect ozone on these exoplanets? So, so we've measured some things in the atmospheres of very massive planets. Okay. But we haven't ever measured anything on a planet like the Earth. And right. I don't believe we have the technology to do that at the moment. Okay. So we have the, we, well, that's not quite true. We probably know how to do it, but it's extremely expensive. Right. And parts of it have not been done before. So there are aspects of it that we haven't actually successfully done. So we'd need to do other projects in order to make sure we know how to do various parts of the things before we launch a multi-billion dollar thing into space and then discover that some part of it isn't working as we expected. Okay, um, so presumably that, that same sort of question would, would apply to 
trying to discover water yes. on, on yep. the planet. That's right. Okay. Now, I think they have found water on, in the atmosphere of a very, very massive planet. Well, these are claims right. that they've found it. But right. again, these are big planets like Jupiter or Saturn, so not things we would expect to find life. Um, so again, we haven't been able to do that on anything that, that would be small enough to potentially be habitable. Okay. Now, uh, one of the other things that I've, I've heard about is a the term life zone. Yes. Is this one that's familiar to you? Um, it's probably what we would call a habitable zone. Okay. Yes. Right. So life zone equals habitable zone. Now. These aren't necessarily the same for all stars, are they? No. Well, so the habitable zone is relatively simplistically defined. It's simply okay. the region around a particular star where the temperature is such that liquid water could exist. So, so oh, that's right. all it is. And so we're assuming that that's the crucial thing for life. Now, we right. may be wrong, of course. Yeah. Um, but if you take a star like the sun, it's typically a roundabout at the same distance as the Earth from the star and from the sun. If you take a star that's less massive, which is cooler, then that zone is closer in. And if you take a star that's more massive, that's much hotter, that zone moves further out. So the exact range of distances depends on the mass and hence temperature of, of the star that you're considering. Okay, right. So identify your star, then you can sort yes, out where the habitable right, zone yeah, yeah, is, yeah. then you sort out where the planet is. Exactly, yeah. Is it in the habitable yeah, zone? Yeah. But there are other factors, for example, I mean, there's Kepler-22b, which is a, the first planet around a star like the Sun that's in that star's habitable zone. But it's potentially a very massive planet, which potentially means it still is too hot on its surface for life. But if you had a moon going around that planet that happened to be similar to the size of the Earth, you'd suddenly have an object orbiting this very big planet, but was at a more suitable size but orbiting at the right distance from its star. So there are some people looking at whether or not moons around planets could be habitable. Because if you know there's a big planet at the right place, but you know that planet can't have life, could that planet have a moon on it that could have life, you see? So there's various other ideas uh, here as well. Um, some stars are binary stars. Yes, yeah. um, is it possible for binary stars to have planets? Yeah. So we found certainly, and I'm trying to remember exactly, we certainly, I believe, have found planets around stars that have binary companions. So you've got planets going around one of the stars and there's another star that's a companion to that system. Okay. I'm trying to think if I'm right when I say that we found a planet around that's orbiting a binary star. I might be wrong about that. We might have. But, uh, but certainly you could have, you know, if the, if the two stars aren't too close together, then the disk around one of those stars could happily form planets in it without being too badly influenced by the other star. And if you had two stars that were very close together, you could have a disk around both stars that form planets in it. So you could have planets going around both of the stars rather than around simply one of them. So, ah. so, so yes, and so certainly okay. we found planets in binary systems. We haven't, um, All right. so, so we certainly know that that is possible. Okay, now am I right in thinking that um, we're actually able to detect stars wobbling because planets go yeah, Yes, around. exactly, yeah, that's yeah. right. Okay. From the velocity measurements, actually. So we can't yet do accurate enough measurements to actually physically see the star moving in the sky, but we can measure its velocity and measure it moving away and towards us. And that tells you that it's wobbling. Yeah, exactly, It's yeah. wobbling because something's going around, around it, yeah. and that something is, in all probability, yeah. a could, planet. Could be a planet, that's right, yeah. Okay. All right. Well, I think that's probably about as much as I ought to subject you to. Um, I can only say thank you so very, very much for the time you have um, devoted to us and um, wish you well in your future research projects. Thank you very much. It's a great pleasure. If you weren't able to attend Dr. Wright's full lecture, you may be pleased to hear that you can soon order a copy of the live video recording made on the night. Information on how to order this and other DVDs will be available on our website in the SAS shop section. And now a few announcements. We were happy to learn that our neighbours in the Orkney Islands recently formed an astronomical society themselves. The webpage is 
www.spanglefish.com slash Orkney Astronomical Society. Why not have a look to see what they're about? We would also like to take this opportunity to congratulate our honorary president, Professor John Brown, who has been awarded the Royal Astronomical Society Gold Medal for Geophysics 2012. John is awarded the medal for his, I quote, outstanding work in research, leadership and outreach, and has inspired the astronomical passions of thousands of people across the UK and overseas through presentations in person and on the television and radio. A full report is available at the University of Glasgow's Astronomy and Astrophysics Group webpage or go to John's website www.johncbrown.org Congratulations John! Back in March we were visited by our good friend Brian Sheen from the Roseland Observatory in Cornwall. Brian was back in Shetland to witness the burning of a replica Viking galley, which was part of the local Upheliar Fire Festival. But we persuaded him to give a short interview whilst he was here. The SAS is planning to work more closely with Roseland in the near future. Our first project will be to observe the transit of Venus across the face of the Sun at sunrise on the 6th of June 2012 when we hope to set up a live stream of what we see. The Roseland Observatory also plans to stream their view of the event. We hope to get a cloudless sky between us. Details of the project and links to the streams will be posted on our website www.shetlandastrosoc.org.uk in the next radio programme, we'll let you know how we got on. But first, back to the interview. Brian Sheen was involved in a BBC Stargazing Live event earlier this year when the Eden Project in Cornwall switched off their lights to draw attention to the issue of light pollution. Angie and myself spoke to Brian about the Astro event at the Eden Project site and Ryan gave an update on what's new at the observatory. The SAS interview. Hi Brian, welcome back to Shetland. Thank you for giving us an update on activities at the Roseland Observatory. Firstly, can you tell us about Stargazing Live? Stargazing Live is a BBC primetime television programme aimed at the general public with a view to increasing everyone's interest in astronomy and all matters astronomical and space. What is the Eden Project and how did you get involved? We were actually running our activities from the Eden Project, which is a world famous attraction, one of the largest in the United Kingdom, and it consists of principally of two large biomes, where in one, the, a tropical forest exists, and in the other, a Mediterranean environment is, has been created. What were you doing at the Eden Project? We were actually taking over the Mediterranean biome and what we call the link, which is the area joining the tropical to the Med biome, and it provides the ideal location for activities of this sort. And obviously, because it was astronomical and done in the night time, we needed to have a group of telescopes out on display. And we had half a dozen quite large scopes down there being manned up by a number of our volunteers. So this was for Stargazing Live, was it? This was a part of the project? This that? is part of the project. Mm -hmm. So what um, activities were happening that evening? Was there various things going on? Or yeah. Just telescopes? Or? No, no. We have more than just telescopes. What we're actually doing, we had um, from Plymouth University, we had an inflatable planetarium where people could crawl in and learn about the space, space the solar system and the, and the galaxy younger children we had a, a theatre called Squash Box Theatre and truly we were we reckon we were the most diverse of all the attractions being offered so throughout the, the UK. 
So was it theatre of play or was it, what was that? No, it's sort of puppets really. Mm -hmm. It operates out of a very small sort of uh, portable theatre zone, a bit like Punch and Judy, a little bit, little bit better. Uh, and uh, although it is sort of done in a light-hearted way, it actually, uh, the science that comes across is accurate and very well put, put together. Mm -hmm. mm. So we like that. <laughs> so was the Stargazing Live a success event then? Or oh yes, yes. Since principally because we were able to give so many different activities to two and a half thousand people. Mm -hmm. the, it was probably the biggest event of its type in the whole country. Mm -hmm. And um, we were expecting about five, six hundred maximum, and so we'd geared everything that we were putting on to numbers of that size. Yeah. When we got two and a half thousand people come in, then obviously we were overwhelmed, really. And if we'd known there were going to be that many, then clearly we would have presented the entire project in a slightly different way to accommodate much bigger numbers. And you turned the lights off as part of the, the project as well, did you? Or? Yes, yes we did. The, the light turning off was an integral part of the whole operation to give people an idea of the uh, corrosive effect, for want of a better word, of street lights and industrial lights on the people's ability to see the night sky. Mm -hmm. We were just one of several places that turned the lights out during the programme and it was well seen and well appreciated though of course in our case it was cloudy mm -hmm. so we weren't able to show people more stars that way. That's a shame. Yeah. It was a shame but we demonstrated the uh, need for it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Brian, you are also director of the Roseland Observatory in Cornwall. What experiments are in progress at the moment? We've got quite a bit ongoing at the moment and uh, one of them is micrometeorite collecting and um, as you know when comets go through the sky they leave behind a tail that's one of the characteristics of a, of a big comet and years later probably the earth will run through that tail and it produces what we call a meteor shower the one that everybody will know about is the August meteors called the Perseids well as you go through that then the little meteors themselves burn up in the atmosphere and seen no more but some are so tiny that they will actually float to earth without burning up and then can be collected from in our case the roof of the observatory and it is then collected into a specialist dust collection unit and harvested from there and examined under very special optical and eventually electron microscopes we're hoping to actually do some new work in the sense that we're looking at a slightly different particle size range from what's been traditionally regarded as micrometeorites but we will be able to analyze the materials that we get uh, to demonstrate that they've come from space and not just from the surrounding environment. Mm. So how do you tell the difference how would you know they're from space then? Well basically we'll be able to tell the difference from the actual minerals that there are in the in the dust that we've collected mm. and also you can cut and polish them and in some cases the metallic ones will actually give a particular pattern so we can do this, yes. Okay. What activities does Roseland Observatory have for young people? Right, well we do actually operate for youngsters and we can do it on several levels, one of which is to bring in school groups, classes of primary schools or secondary school children and then we can run through a programme which corresponds to their particular key stage as we call it in England and uh, that fits very well. There are very few youngsters that are, are not turned on either by astronomy or dinosaurs and we're able to show them a little bit about dinosaurs as well because we got a sample of a meteorite that uh, went in at New Mexico and uh, some of the fallout from that we have in the observatory and we can show people. It's 65 million years old and very very small but nevertheless that's what it is and people are somewhat impressed we hope and so that's one thing we also run uh, an individual astronomy for interest a basic introductory course and that is also attracting a number of school children independently of schools but with their own parents and that's proving success and I'm sure that we will be expanding that uh, very soon another level that we do is through work experience means that then year 10s which are 14 15 year old children come into the observatory and work for us for a week 
they actually work as trainee astronomers, that's what we call them. They take part in all the routine measurements that are going on. They'll take part in the actual building of equipment if necessary. And if we're actually going out to a school, then they'll go out with us. They may have the chance to take part in a radio interview or something of that sort. So it's pretty diverse. And to be honest, it is genuine work that's required to be done at the time. There is no set program. And uh, it it uh, has proved successful over the over the years. Mm -hmm. I heard you had a new piece of equipment mounted on a truck. What's all that about? A big heavy piece of so kit, a big piece of equipment on the back of a truck you just received? Oh, yeah, there, that was, about? there was a, a radio telescope which came in from Cambridge on the back of a truck. Mm -hmm. We're hoping to uh, sell the, the dumper truck that it came in on uh, and then put the uh, radio dish itself up on a, a stray lighting a light tower mm -hmm. which we shall have relieved the local football club of right. shortly. <laughs> Do we know about that yet? Yeah. Oh they know about okay, it. That's yes, fine. yes. Oh yes. <laughs> uh -huh. And uh, that will be good. And what we will be doing is looking at the sun mm -hmm. because that's particularly active at the moment. Shetlanders will no doubt be aware of the northern lights, the Aurora Borealis mm -hmm. that's been seen up here. And uh, what we're also looking at is the fact that there's an Austrian about to jump out of a perfectly safe <laughs> g uh, gondola. Not Viking. No, no, not a Viking, <laughs> but an Austrian, this one. And he's going to do that in New Mexico, probably mm -hmm. coming down near Roswell. Mm -hmm. And um, he's coming for 120,000 feet. And the point is with that, that he will be exposed to any potential dangerous radiation from the sun should any be occurring at that time. Mm -hmm. and what we're doing, we're tying together the work experience that's going on. And we're actually then training the youngsters in using our equipment and we're recording data over the period from sort of April to August when this is happening. And then we will be able to forecast quite accurately what exactly uh, are the conditions likely to be at the given date of jump. We've mm -hmm. already been in contact with the team and they seem quite keen to get this information anyway mm -hmm. and it will be tailored to what to their needs but they of course will be the ones making the decision to jump or not to jump. Mm -hmm. Sounds quite interesting. Mm. Mm -hmm. I think so I like to think that the uh, youngsters coming in will actually like to do this sort of real project mm -hmm. it gives the idea that it's not a five minute thing be run over several months quite a lot of in-depth analysis will have to be carried out. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> what advice would you give to aspiring astronomers? Right, well people that are going to make astronomers in uh, their uh, university days will in fact already probably have an interest and so therefore to persuade their teachers to get them involved in the from the earliest days that they can really either from what we call primary school under 11 year olds then through their secondary schooling up through their hires and advanced hires, they can all do various bits and pieces towards it. The key subject really is physics and to get a good grip on that with some chemistry as well and there are other subjects which they might find useful as they go along but uh, the uh, university opportunities in Scotland seem to be pretty good for mm -hmm. people with an interest and then they obviously then have to develop that and take up a career themselves and what careers will be available to them are changing all the time to be honest but um, again what we're trying to do with school children especially is to look for asteroids there's a international program that we're uh, preparing to participate in where we have uh, a number of images sent through to us from the sort of central hub of this organization in America we will use the children to actually do the analysis because their eyes are young and fit and they will be looking for things that are moving mm -hmm. uh, and then should we discover something then we'll obviously have to send a proper report back and um, again it's something which is not quick it's not instant and science isn't instant mm -hmm. they'll have to be aware that it's hard work and it takes time but it can be rewarding and certainly very informative well, thank you very much, Brian. Thank you for your time. It's been very interesting. Thanks. Thank you. thank you. If you find the online radio interviews interesting, you might like to join an astronomical society near you to find out more about astronomy. 
There are also a number of short courses and online video lessons available to further your interest. Here just a few examples. Glasgow University holds a series of short courses and day events in astronomy. More information from www.gla.ac.uk slash courses slash open studies. The Khan Academy has a number of video lessons free to view online in a range of subjects. Topics in astronomy include the Big Bang Theory, Redshift and how the Earth's tilt causes seasons. It's well worth a look as there are plenty of videos available. Please go to www.khanacademy.org and search for astronomy to find out more. The Open University has a number of modules for distance learners. Go to www.open.ac.uk they also have free video clips and online course units which they are offering as part of their free Open Learn project. These are well worth exploring. Just go to open.edu. Finally, Liverpool's John Moore University is offering short astronomy courses especially tailored for distance learning. For example, Introduction to Astronomy or the universe through a small telescope. More information is available from www.astro.ljmu.ac.uk slash distance. An online search should provide many more sources for you to consider. Thank you for your interest. Please feel free to browse our website at shetlandastrosoc.org.uk for astrophotos, links to useful web resources and details of coming events. We now also have a Google Plus site, Shetland Stargazer, where you can log in no matter what your location and share your astronomy experiences with us. Thanks to Chris for setting this up. Please also see Chris's other site, www.unpossible.info, for short podcasts aimed at Shetland observers. On YouTube, you can visit the Ostro Astro video channel, where you can find a video version of this radio broadcast and more. Our next winter edition will be available at the beginning of December 2012 when we hope to interview Professor Charles Cockell, astrobiologist from the University of Edinburgh and Professor John Brown, Astronomer Royal for Scotland. We hope to ask Professor Cockell about his forthcoming lecture The Search for Life Beyond the Earth. Professor John Brown will be visiting Shetland to speak about the magic of gravity and the structure of the universe and we hope to find out more in his interview. For more information on these speakers and details of our autumn programme please visit our website. That's all for now from the team. We hope you enjoyed the programme. Please send any comments to astro-mike at hotmail.co.uk or to astrosass.mike at gmail.com We hope you have a good summer. So it's goodbye until next time. This programme was made by Mikey from the Sass. On the microphone was Anna. Music was composed by Lyle Campbell, Kelly Nicholson and Mike Bryman. Uh.